I'm Mark Whiteman, I'm Head of Development at Redgate. Um, this is Kevin Boyle, um, who's one of our software engineers um, and works on one of the teams uh, from which we'll be giving a few examples um, in the presentation. So, we want to take the opportunity to talk a little bit about the role of feedback in Agile projects um, and why we think it's such a critical aspect of any successful um, Agile project. Um, before we crack into the main content, I want to give you a little bit of context because it's relevant for some of the examples. Um, so we won't spend too long on this, but just a little bit of background about Redgate and about the sort of products that we, that we build um, and our business model. So we, provide, we create products for software professionals um, and these are generally developers, um, database developers, .NET developers, um, sometimes, uh, some of our products are aimed at uh, database administrators, software professionals in, in, in general, mostly in the Microsoft world at the moment. Um, we're about 200 people. And our business model, which again is relevant to some of the examples, is uh, a download, evaluate, buy or not buy um, model. So what's critical about that um, is that that evaluation experience has to be a great one. Um, if the product doesn't work um, for a user, or if it's not intuitive enough for them to uh, work out how to use, there's no one from Redgate there to, um, to sort of guide them through it. It's just, it's just got to work. So design um, of user experience um, is a critical aspect of our products and we'll, we'll come to some of that um, a little later. We've been doing um, agile development um, for you know, roughly four years now um, and we're continually trying to improve, improve what we do. Um, just a few example products just to give you a little flavour of, of what sort of things they are. Um, one of our products, the one that, that Kevin works on right now, um, is a product called SQL Source Control, which is a product that lets um, database developers store their database schema and data in Source Control, in their, their existing Source Control system, and have all of the advantages that, um, that we do with, with code in the Source Control system. We also have performance profiles for .NET code, um, SQL Server, monitoring and alerting tool. Um, but these are all, essentially, the, the common theme here is that they're all relatively um, small products, they're not big systems, um, they're solutions that so products that solve a specific problem for a specific set of people. Um, so why are we here? Well, in agile development we hear a lot about small and frequent releases. So XP for example um, talks about small releases, uh, Scrum calls out you know, potentially shippable increments. Um, and we talk about the sort of value and visibility and you know, the cycle um, a lot. But why? Well, one obvious reason is to deliver value. We want to deliver value quickly to users. We don't want to batch up um, a lot of work and deliver you know, at the end of a year or an 18-month project cycle, for example. But the other key, uh, key reason that we want to do those frequent releases is to learn and to learn about a variety of different things, and we'll come to, come to those during the rest of the presentation. Um, and to learn, we need feedback. And that feedback comes in many different types, and it comes from lots of different places. And consequently, we can use it for lots of different um, reasons. Um, our feeling is that without that feedback, you're really flying by, blind. So you're going to make assumptions, um, you're going to go with your instinct um, over evidence. And really, you're not going to optimize on, a, um, on the best solution. So a little bit more about that. Obviously, when we start building products, uh, we would like to imagine that we knew exactly what our customers want. And that's not just features, but that's the user experience. You know, what will not just solve their problem, but delight them. Um, it'd be great if we, if we knew that was. We could, uh, we could just start building it and uh, progress straight to a product which delighted our users and made us lots of money. Um, obviously, that's not the case. Um, I don't think that's the case for any software system. You know, a, a system or a product, um, often the users themselves don't even really know what it is that they, that they need. Um, so obviously, this is one of the core principles behind um, agile development. Um, so our, um, our users actually want something different. So we need to change our path. And that's where feedback comes in. We really need that rich feedback. Um, we need it frequently, we need it to be valuable, and it comes in lots of different flavors. 
um, to help us help guide us um, to a good solution, a perfect solution, if you like. Maybe that's uh, overrating it, but at least something which will be successful. So we're going to present um, a model of feedback. We're going to talk about a variety of different types of feedback, and we're going to work our way up this pyramid. So we're going to start with um, some feedback which comes from the team. So it's internal feedback, um, but nevertheless valuable, valuable feedback. You'll see as we work our way up this uh, model that we're going to talk about types of feedback that have um, progressively more data, um, but also less context. So the types of feedback that we talk about first are rich in context. Um, we'll have lots of information about, um, uh, about the environment for that uh, and reasons for that um, feedback. And as we get up to the top, we'll have lots more data, but nowhere near as much context. So, so these provide some different challenges um, in sort of anal analyzing and, and using, the, um, using the feedback. So we'll talk about feedback within the team that influences um, product designs and um, backlog, the sort of features that we, that we add. We'll talk about feedback from our early access programs and actually getting pre-release versions of software um, in front of users. We'll talk about the role of exception reporting and understanding the stability of, um, of products and features in the field. And we'll talk about feature usage reporting, which is um, really about as understanding the use of the product, the real released product in the field and what we can learn from that. Let's start off with stuff, some stuff about the team. Well, the first um, type of feedback mechanism that, uh, that we use a lot is paper prototyping. So this is a mechanism whereby we can take our sketched user interface designs, so our preliminary designs for a feature and we can get very quick feedback before we've started development, before we've started um, really baking anything in. But try and understand whether, the gro whether there are any gross errors in the designs, in our assumptions about the feature. Um, so we have used a set of user experience specialists, so every team has a user experience specialist who will lead the team in sketching out um, designs for, for a feature. And the first thing we do once we've got those designs, and we, uh, designs that we think look good, um, is to sit down with it. Hope it'd be nice for it to be used. That's not, what, not always feasible for us, but at least a proxy user. It could be somebody around the company if we think they're somewhat representative of our customers. Um, it could be just somebody in the team to walk through with sketches the workflow of a task. And that helps us to, um, to catch gross errors, gross um, uh, errors in assumptions and information pre presented. So we're really looking at workflow um, through different screens, um, through different elements of the user interface to see whether they, um, whether they appear to work. So generally a paper prototyping session will work with you know, one or more sketches on paper. So they might actually be physically sketches or mock-ups with a, you know, a tool like Balsamic, um, something which has a sort of sketch-like feel. But crucially, we're not talking about aesthetics. We're not talking about detailed design. We're just talking about high-level um, concepts. You know, on this screen, you will see this information, and then you click here to go to the next screen, and you get this sort of feedback. Um, it's it's that, that sort of that sort of level. Um, so usually these sessions will have um, obviously a user or a proxy user, um, a facilitator, and often somebody. We, although we don't have it in this photo, somebody um, playing the role of the computer. So if there's multiple screens, then Often what we have is, you know, the user sort of clicks on a button, somebody rapidly grabs the right sketch, presents it, okay, now this is what you're, this is what you're seeing. Um, so this is a very fast thing you can do. Um, we do a lot of this, and it helps to really course correct and, um, and get in the right uh, sort of area with design very quickly. Um, so let's move on to usability testing. So this is really next level up. Um, from a, from a paper, prototyping, pro, paper prototyping session. So here we're working on real product. This is code that's been written, features that, are, um, that have been implemented. And they're a much more structured session with a real user. Sometimes that's in person. Often for us, it's a remote session with the user. A lot of our um, customers are in, are in the States um, or, or, or in other countries um, in Europe. And we, um, we have them do a remote session where they will remote into our usability lab. And... Um, We'll spend about an hour with them, and often the team 
Uh, in fact, in most cases, the development team will be sitting in the room, not interacting, sort of silently in the background just to observe and, un and understand how the user interacts with the software. We will ask um, the user to perform a variety of tasks. So we'll give it, so it's, so it's structured, we'll say, okay, here are some instructions. We would like you to do X with the software. And we will watch what they do. And we ask them um, to tell us what they're thinking. So particularly if they're struggling to understand, you know, what to click, where to go next, we want their thought processes. You know, what is it that you're looking for there? Um, why, you know, um, why is that confusing for you? Is the terminology wrong? Is this not a concept that you, you know, a, a term that you understand? Um, what sort of assumptions have you got that we haven't anticipated? And often that's pretty eye-opening. Um, the output from um, that usability session is usually one or more um, changes to the user interface. So it might be actually the user looked for uh, this particular feature being on a context menu. We hadn't thought that they would look in that menu for this sort of function. It might be something more fundamental about the designs so that this just doesn't fit a mental model that they, that they have of the world. Um, but usually what we do is have a debrief uh, with the team who've observed the session um, at the end and distill what have we learned from that session that we want to take forward into the designs. And actually Kevin's team right now are uh, um, innovating with a new way of tracking that, um, that sort of information. So this is their sort of usability test board, um, which shows um, sort of on the left hand side, these are various issues that have been observed in, in tests. Um, uh, what the reaction to, um, uh, to those um, issues was, how many people have um, encountered those, um, and the priority that we, um, we've given to it, and then what action is going to happen. You know, we, is somebody going to go away and try to some new designs to solve the problem? Is it something that needs a different sort of solution? Is it something that needs more investigation? Um, but to give everybody visibility of what issues do we have, what are we going to do about it? So all of this is about feeding back into the designs, um, understanding how to iterate features and um, come up with designs, user interface or sort of behavior of the product, which is, um, uh, which is optimized for, you know, for, real, for real users. So who we're talking about um, feedback about the usability of features, about specific issues that we need to solve that, are, um, that would hamper adoption, um, and also the emotional reaction of users, I and mean, that's something that we often neglect um, around the software community. And in particular, over the last couple of years, um, the notion of user experience has ra been raised, you know, by people like Apple, as a canonical example, um, to new levels. So users have in their everyday lives more examples of great user experience, and that raises the bar for our software. It means that there's much less tolerance for poor user experience and um, negative reaction about um, usability of software. So that's a challenge for, I think, all software, um, but in particular our products in, this, in our business model, which is download, evaluate, buy. If they don't have a great experience with it, there's other people they can go to. Um, so we have to raise our bar around that as well. So a feedback mechanism that you're probably um, more familiar with is the, um, is the sprint review or the, or the iteration review. Um, now obviously in the, uh, we're doing sort of something a bit scrum-like at Regate right now in most, in most of our teams. Um, textbook scrum talks about sprint reviews being um, about the product owner formally signing off that you know, the features are, features are done. Um, at Redgate, we're not, you know, we're not really doing that. Um, we've got a much more informal culture. Um, the product owners sit right next to the team, so there's lots of informal contact. They know what's going on. Um, so these reviews aren't so much about signing off as the chance to just take a step back, get out of the day-to-day, -day, oh, we're working on this feature, and just take a minute to look at the product and you know, the, the recently implemented features um, you know, together and say, are we happy? Are we happy to say that we're finished with that? Does this meet our notion of what a quality feature would look like? Um, and you know, the whole team together, essentially, sort of signing off on a on a feature. Um, 
So typically that will involve end-to-end -end demos of features, um, possibly discussion about the usability issues that we've solved and um, making sure there are no outstanding ones. Um, and an opportunity for the team and the product owner just to discuss together, are we happy to, to move on at this, at this stage? Now, um, that's great. But actually what we've encountered and what, what Kevin's team have encountered um, a few times is, ah, now when we look at this, we've just stopped, we've looked at it and we've realized, we should have realized that thing isn't finished. We, we've, we've made a misassumption there. Um, maybe we, we meant to finish this thing in, in one way and we haven't, or, um, or some new information comes to light from somebody in the team. And that involves, ah, right, we've got to go back, rework that um, frustration. Um, and, and generally a sense of, ah, oh, we should have known, we should have known. Luckily, um, there is a strong continuous improvement culture at Redgate. Um, we do regular retrospectives and we try and make changes. Um, so Kevin's team came up with a new idea, so this is an, an improvement. Um, daily demos. Um, so this is something that Kevin's team are doing, same time, every day, five o'clock? Yeah. Five o'clock. Um, it's very informal. Um, whoever's working on the feature, plus the user experience specialist, plus the product owner, and they'll demo the features. So we'll just sit down, we'll work through a workflow, what have we got right now, um, have a discussion, bring all the information to the table, and if we want to change something, great, we'll change it straight away. Before it's baked in, no delay, no rework later on. Um, so it's an optimization. So, that's re so this is all feedback from within the team about information we already have, things that become apparent um, during development, um, and let's make sure that we sort of optimize that, that process. So again, that's the same sort of feedback as the sprint reviews, just brought, brought earlier. So we've talked about um, feedback that you can get from within the team um, and from users without having to sort of ship software. Um, next, we're gonna, Kevin's going to talk a little bit about um, how to um, get more feedback from actually having software, uh, having users use the software in their own environments. Um, and again, we're moving up this pyramid, so we're going to see that at this point we start to get much more data, but lose some context because we're not able to observe them in the same way that we can with the feedback mechanism we've talked about so far. Cheers. Uh, good morning. So. Yeah, as Mark said, we try to get feedback during the whole development process, but ultimately you're not building this software for yourself, for your own team. You're either going to ship this to somebody else in your organization, uh, if it's an internal product, or else, and as is the case with Redgate, we ship to external customers in hopes they'll buy our tools. So really you need to just ship early and ship often. So if we take, for example, um, the product I work on, which is SQL Source Control, so it connects, as Mark said, um, a Microsoft SQL Server database to a source control system like Git or Subversion or TFS. Uh, why, why, why might we want to ship early and often? Um, because real users are going to use it in unexpected ways. So being a database product, um, they'll have different data sets that we tested with or different data types. Um, and it's, it's good to get it out there and see does it solve the problem for those users. They're going to use it in a real environment. So we do lots and lots of automated testing, but and we hope it's representative of, of a typical user, but it may not be. So our source control system and our database are on the same network, um, but in the real world, this may not be the case. So basically, this is just sort of indicative of, of a larger point that you can't understand how the user is going to use a product until they're actually using it. And then finally, there's a sort of an element of scale to it. So we do usability testing as early as possible. We work hard to make sure that those users we think are typical users, we take them from across the user base in the hope that if we can make every one of the usability sessions quite happy, then that'll make all of our users quite happy. But that's not always the case, so it's good to get it out to as many people as we can and get their feedback as early as possible. So the way we ship early is called our early access program. So it's a slice of the product that's stable and well tested, but it's not completely finished. It's, we allow ourselves some room to iterate if we need it. And we ship it out to users and we get their feedback and we sort of let their feedback direct where we're going to take the feature. So if they're happy, then we can call that feature done, do some further testing and move on to the next 
uh, the next feature we want to implement. But what often happens is the user will say, really for this feature to become very useful, we need X, Y, or Z. And then we'll add that to the backlog and we'll, we'll do those things next. And agile techniques, be it we yeah, use a scrum-like technique, but whatever you use are very good for allowing this kind of development because we'll, we'll get that feature ready before we move on to the next. Um, so if we take, uh, this is SQL Source Control, which is a, a plugin for SQL Server Management Studio, which is Microsoft's database IDE. So if we zoom in, you can see this provide feedback link. And we have this in the early access releases and in the final product. Because we still want to engage with users all the time. If they're using the product, we want a really low friction way for them to be able to just give feedback to RedKit immediately. So if they choose to click this link, they can take in the user voice, which is a third party product. Um, but basically it's sort of like Stack Overflow. People can suggest ideas, um, you can browse other people's ideas and you can vote up ideas. So in theory, all we have to do is get the top ideas from this and implement them and we have happy users. And that's pretty much what we did for version two. So when we shipped version one, there was four or five things that we wanted to do next, but we sort of let the feedback from user voice direct what we would do. And we implemented just the two top features from user voice, among other things, but that was like the headline features. But it's, it's not a foolproof solution and it can just spark a discussion. So you really need to combine it with um, other data collection techniques, so that can be surveys or emails, phone calls, customer visits, whatever way you want to get feedback from your users. And this is what we had to do for version three. So we noticed a trend on user voice that people wanted to work around slight edge, condition, edge cases in the product. Um, and individually they were all quite small, but if you take a step back and sort of see a bigger picture, what they were really asking for was a way to be able to disable a part of our product and overwrite it. So we did this for version three. So this migrations feature um, didn't come from user voice. It, there was no, you know, 5,000 users asked us to do this. But when we take all the smaller ideas and put them together, we come up with this. And now we've started showing it to users, and users really, really like it. So how do you deal with all the feedback? As I said, we shipped to like 2,000 people. So you get a lot of feedback, a lot of variations on a theme, and who does all this collation? Well, at Reggae, we have like really great product managers, and they, as I said, talk to customers all the time. So that can be email, user voice feedback, customer visits, whatever, and trade shows. They just talk to customers all the time, and then come up with things that the team can do. So that's what we get from shipping early and shipping often. And the biggest output is the backlog. So David will come up with ideas, our product manager will come up with ideas and feed that into the roadmap of the product. Unfortunately, one of the consequences, an inevitable consequence really of shipping any software, and particularly shipping software that's under development, active development, is that you're going to hit bugs. So how do we deal with that? Well, we use exception reporting. So exception reporting, just for anyone to give a little context, is this kind of dialogue, as you've probably seen a million times if you use Windows, software crashes and you can send an error report or don't send. So I highly recommend you send, because it's very useful. We, uh, we use Smart Assembly uh, at RedKit. It's a RedKit product itself, and it does uh, obfuscation and exception reporting and feature usage reporting that we'll talk about later. So the source control team were already using Smart Assembly for obfuscation, and to get exception reporting, you just had to turn on a button. So we tried it out. So before exception reporting, uh, we found that most people won't report errors, especially Mark mentioned our business model is about people trying it out and liking it and a very quick setup, quick, small, fast downloads, quick install, people can get up and running fast. During that time, if they hit an error, they won't tell us, they'll just move on to the next product. To tell us, they have to go to redgate.com, get the email address, phone number, actually do it, and they probably won't. And if they do choose to contact us, it's lots of work on our part to collect all the information we need to build a reproducible case. So, for example, they might just say this feature doesn't work, but we need to know which version of SQL Server are you running, which version of Windows are you running, etc. And then it relies on the skill of the support engineer to be able to get all this information, diagnose the issue, communicate with the team, work out, yeah, this issue's fixed, 
and they can use this workaround or this build or whatever. So since we started using exception reporting, we find that most users now report exceptions, so it's easy, all they have to do is press one button. We get lots of information about the state of the crash, and I'll show you some of that information in a moment, but basically it gives us context of what they were doing at the time. And if we resolve um, the issue, then we'll automatically email people to let them know that there's a fix available. So the feedback that we get from this is how stable is the product? So as we ship EAs or final releases, we'll catch a common bug. So step one, the product crashes. Um, this is what happens. So if we contrast this with sort of the standard exception reporting dialog, we also ask people for repro steps and their email address. So we find that most people actually do fill this in, um, I guess because we ask for it and also because they have a better chance of getting their bug fixed. So when they press send error report, Smart Assembly will collect all this information and send it up to the Smart Assembly database, which we host for customers. Um, you can get at these error reports directly through Smart Assembly, but there's this additional thing called SA Jira Sync. So internally at RedGate, we use Jira, which is a bug tracking system, just like Bugzilla or whatever else you happen to use. And this SA Jira Sync software um, connects to the Smart Assembly database, grabs all the exception reports, does clever heuristics on them, and adds them to Jira for us. So if lots of different users are hitting the same bug, the same exception product, they'll go to the same bug in Jira. And it's a little bit difficult to read, but you'll see that we get email and user description. And critically, we also get this URL, which is a Smart Assembly report at the top. So if we choose to click on that Smart Assembly report in Jira, we get taken back to the Smart Assembly product, which is sort of a nicer UI with the same information. So if we look at what this gives us, we first of all get the customer's email address and the reproducible steps, so the things that they were entered in before they press send. <coughs> we also get the log files. Um, so this is what the support engineer would have had to ask for to get the context of what they were doing, but we just get automatically. And uh, finally we get um, the stack trace at the time of the exception. For every frame of the stack trace, that's code that RedGit wrote, we also get um, the variables and the values of the variables. So this is a really, really excellent way um, for us to get the, the, the data we need to be able to either solve the bug just purely from this report, or else if we need to contact the user, we can contact the user with sensible questions that'll be targeted questions like, we just need this little bit of extra information as opposed to, sorry you hit a bug, what were you doing? So we already know lots of what they were doing. So do we fix all bugs? If we have all this information, we could theoretically fix all bugs. And do we? Well, no, unfortunately. Um, we find that there's two big classes of bug. There's the bugs that are really common, lots of users hit. We can build up a reproducible case quite quickly, and we'll fix those. And then there's this, you know, sort of standard long tail of bugs where we find that they happen, it's an exception that happens to an individual user that might never happen to that user again. They might, you know, be using the product forever after and be very happy. So we tend not to fix them. But what SA Jira Sync allows is that if these do become common, they'll move up into this, this higher bracket and we'll fix them. So Jeff Atwood, the Stack Overflow guy, um, uses this term exception driven development. And it's sort of what we do as well. So the next bug that we fix in the product is probably the bug with the highest report count. Not always. So during an early access release, for example, we might um, notice a trend of this bug starting to creep up. Even though we've only shipped to 100 users, it's a high percentage of those users have hit it. So we'll fix that before we ship to you know, five, 6,000 users. Um, so what we get from exception reporting is really an understanding of the stability of the product in the field, and we can also fix critical issues. We can fix issues during EA before they become really critical issues for, for our entire user base. So all of this is sort of reactive. We can fix things as they happen to people, but it would be much nicer if we could be proactive and prevent issues from ever happening. So I'll let Mark talk about how we do that. Okay. So the final category of feedback that we want to talk about is um, what we call feature usage reporting. So now we're talking about using the same mechanisms um, 
or, or, or similar mechanisms to, to the ones that Kevin talked about with the exception reporting. We're talking about how do we monitor um, usage of our product in the field in such a way that we can get feedback that will help to um, build better product in the future. So it might be better meaning more stable, it might be um, better tuned to what the customers are actually doing. So uh, for example, um, analyzing how, uh, what sort of databases in, 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 in the sort of SQL source control context, what sort of database activities are people um, doing. Uh, recently we discovered that the majority of our customers there are doing most of the work they do is editing stored procedures. Um, it's not changing tables or views or, or, um, or, other, or other stuff. Now that's a really useful insight into our customers' um, behavior, what problems they're, they're having, that we can use to build a better product um, for them. So, similar to the exception reporting dialogue, we, you, know, you, you may have seen in, in various Microsoft products their sort of customer experience um, program sort of pops up and says, hey, we'd really like you to you know, send us data on how you're using our products. But we have something which is um, directly analogous to that, really. So, we, so it's not in process. Um, and our code is annotated up in such a way that it will give us various um, categories of, of information which will sort of get sent back to Redgate um, on a periodic basis. So the first category is feedback about um, the environment in which uh, the software is being used. So, um, so here there's some, some um, subset of the categories of feedback that we get. Um, we talk about, you know, on the top right hand corner here, we're saying um, you know, what operating systems are um, our customers using? Um, what, uh, what sort of memory do they have? What sort of physical memory? Um, what sort of spec machines are our um, users running our software on? Um, we've, um, so we've discovered, um, for example, Know that our um, customers are mostly on Windows 7 now. That was a useful insight, right? So we can use this sort of information to um, focus our testing on the most frequently um, or typically used um, sort of combinations of, um, of environments. And that's, that's really useful. Obviously, it's impossible to test all combinations of oper operating system, um, sort of memory, uh, monitor sizes, number of cores, there's so many different um, factors there. But being able to focus it down and say, yeah, we'll test you know, across as broad a range as we can, but let's really focus on what we know our customers are actually using um, is, is very valuable. The second category is more related to which features are people actually using in our products. So features are not created equal in any product. Um, or any system. Um, there are features which are the core workflow which people are using all the time. There's edge features which are either um, used by a subset of users or used by all users but less frequently. Um, so we, we're able to see um, for each feature in our product and we can sort of define the relationship between code and the feature somewhat ar arbitrarily. Um, which features are actually used most, most frequently. So, um, so here we've got the list of features um, in, in, in our SQL source com control product. Um, the first column of numbers is total uses um, for a particular build of the software. Um, the second column is um, discrete number of, of users um, from, wh uh, from whom the, the data was collected. Um, so you can see actually um, the bulk of our users, um, so you see about halfway down, which is linked to repository subversion, well, you can see actually most of our um, users are using Subversion as a source control system. That's useful information. Right? We, can, um, we can focus our testing um, and our development effort ar around that if we wish to. Um, the other insight here is a more commercial one, um, which is which features are our customers actually discovering? Um, obviously, in terms of an evaluation experience, we would like our customers to discover as many of the features of our products as possible in order to, um, to guide their buying decision. Uh, you know, if they haven't discovered features that are, that are there, they're not going to have the same perception of value as we would like them to have. Um, and I think that can be extended um, in, in, into other types of software that aren't, that aren't just products as, as well. Um, but generally this builds up a fuller picture of 
use of the software in the field and be able to guide um, future decisions about what do we do next, what's the next most valuable thing for us to, to do. Um, so here's a, here's a concrete example. Um, we have a product um, which is a memory profiler. Um, so it profiles your .NET application um, and lets you um, see the memory use of that application at, at a point in time. Now, when you launch the product, um, you have to take a snapshot. So a snapshot is you know, a picture of memory usage at that moment in time. You have to take a snapshot to get any of the other value from the product. So you can't start analyzing memory usage you know, across your, uh, your, your objects um, until you've taken that snapshot. I think the feature usage um, data, we actually discovered that only 40% of our users were taking that snapshot. So there's an implication there that 60% of our users are actually not getting any value from the product when they first, um, um, first run it. Now, that gives us a hint that we've got a problem, which if we were to solve it, would have um, potentially very significant um, advantages for us. Um, but, here's, but here's the um, slight caveat, caveat to that. Because we haven't got the context, we've got lots of data but very little context here, so we don't know what they were trying to do, we don't know what their thought processes were. Um, we, we can only suspect that we have a problem. So at this point, we really have to follow up with more research. Um, we can't, it, it would be, I think, somewhat naive of us to just launch into a development effort to, to try and improve this without trying to understand more about the problem. And that's a recurring theme through this level of, of feedback is you need to go and get more context. Um, here's another concrete example, um, which is more about saving uh, development time. Um, so in, 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 in Kevin's product, SQL Source Control, um, we have um, some features which uh, collect, uh, in, in order to run those features, we need to collect um, various data about what activity has occurred um, on, on a database through use of a, um, a trace mechanism, which is a SQL Server bit of functionality that we sort of enable through our, through our product. Um, only we discovered that um, that trace by default wasn't collecting information over a, a sufficient length of time for us to get a full picture of everything that happened. Um, so we needed to do some work. Now we could have um, launched into extending the mechanism. There was a means for us to extend the, um, the trace mechanism to work over it, you know, to collect a larger set of data. Um, that would have been um, several weeks worth of work um, for us to do. Um, luckily, we had some feature usage data which showed us that um, it wasn't really uh, pure feature usage, it wasn't how many times people used features, but more something that we'd annotated up as extra information to report back through the same mechanism that told us that um, the amount of activity on people's databases, you know, the number of times they were changing stored procedures or tables or views or, or you know, whatever, um, was, uh, was so much that actually even if we went um, and did that work and extended the mechanism to its maximum capability, it wouldn't work. We would only um, slightly reduce the problem. We wouldn't solve the problem. So we were able to um, rethink, take a completely different path and essentially save a whole month's worth of development work because we understood how the product was being used by real customers in the field. So that's a big advantage. So just to sort of recap, feedback that we're gaining from, from sort of feature usage um, is being what environments do our users have? What's the, um, what environments are they using the software in? And um, are users discovering features? Are they, you know, what's the use, uh, usage rate of those features? Now we're not here yet, but um, just a note to where we'd like to go with this, which is, um, I've noted that often in, um, certainly in Scrum, um, we talk about a feature being done when it's been implemented and tested and maybe signed off. Um, but that's not really done. Done is when a cus customers are actually using and getting value from the software. Um, and I think there are some, there are some sort of, um, people who are in more of a Kanban um, uh, world who, who've taken this, this idea. And I, where we'd really like to get to is being able to measure usage of features in the field as a direct measure of, um, 
of doneness and say, well, we're not done with this feature until this many people or this proportion of people have successfully used this feature um, and then we can move on. Um, we're not there, but that's where we want to go. So we've talked about um, feedback me mechanisms during development um, from um, sort of early access releases, sort of pre-releases, um, exception reporting for um, understanding stability, and feature usage reporting, which gives us um, feedback on um, environments, uh, designs, um, uh, features. And um, I'll let Kevin just finish off. Cheers. You have to give me the slightly cheesy photo that I nabbed from Wikipedia, which is that all of this feedback is really good for Redgate, and it makes total sense just the way we've outlined. But there's sort of like a slight icing on the cake that as a team we like collecting this feedback because it's very good at motivating you. So it's sort of a nice feeling when you um, write a feature to know that in two weeks or less customers will be playing with that feature, um, you get no exception reports from them, you get lots of feature issues data. So that's just a really nice added bonus of having these feedback mechanisms sort of baked into your process. So as part of code reviews, we think about the exception reports, we think about this code that we've just written, can it go through feature use reporting, can we get extra data from it? So that's just it's sort of baked into the process at this stage. So there's some photographs from like around the office, which are, you know, slightly cheesy, but around the office we have quotes from users and it's sort of nice to get this feedback and it encourages you to, to do the next release even better. And then, because at the end of the day we're a commercial company, it's quite nice to see that you get nice feedback through the EA, EA release and you hope that when you actually ship, that the downloads will be nice and high and that the sales graph is up and to the right. So this feedback's good for that sort of thing. Um, additionally, we're, oh, look at that. We're hiring, by the way. <laughs> so, we sort of had to include that. So there's roles for everyone, um, user experience, designers, uh, testers, uh, developers, product managers, I think. Um, if you go to regular.com, you'll get the, the full list. Um, yeah, careers by regular.com. Or you can come and chat to me and talk to them. So do you have any questions? Yeah. <laughs> Good question. Um, I really haven't thought that far. Um, my uh, my gut answer to that would be um, at least we would learn that maybe we'd spent effort on something that we shouldn't have done. Um, so I think trying to um, understand what yeah what decision you would make or what change you would make based on that on that data is an important important thing. And there is a, you know there is a, a downside to this amount of data which is um, something that we see right now because we're not quite mature enough at, at, um, at this yet, which is you get a lot of data and there's a temptation to just stare at lots of data, you know, drown in it, basically. Um, so I think the, the right angle is to say, what are we trying to find out and which data do we need in order to find that, to find that out, answer that question, you know, test that hypothesis. Um, so that's, that's really the angle that we're going to try and come to from. Uh, yes, yeah, so we tried. We tried to do that. Smart Assembly gives you a lot of this for free, so we try to match. Or if we see that no one's using Windows XP anymore, we can make two decisions from that. We will do limited testing on Windows XP. We'll still do some because some users are using it and they should get a good experience. But we'll concentrate the bulk of our testing on Windows Seven, for example. And for my product in particular, what's even more important is database version. So we also collect that. We know what versions of SQL Server people are running. So we do concentrate all of our testing, or a lot of our testing, on the most popular versions of SQL Server. Um, yeah, we, we use that data for that. Uh, you can also use it for um, 
So we, we built a product top of .NET. And because our business model relies on people being able to try out the product quickly, we don't want them to have to install a new version of .NET unnecessarily, which means that we sometimes don't get to use the coolest new stuff from Microsoft. But the feature usage reporting tells us that often this is something we're unnecessarily scared of, that all of our users are actually way up the .NET versions. And so recently we've been able to use the feature usage data to take bets on using newer technologies to do cooler stuff. Um, no, the answer. Um, so we have quite a wide range of different projects um, aimed at different sorts of users. Um, typically the products which are aimed at developers, um, we have much more appetite for pre-releases, early experimental builds um, than for example um, our products who are aimed at, uh, that are aimed at DBAs. Um, so there's, there's categories of users who are more or less risk averse um, and we can get more data, substantially more data from, um, from, the, uh, from the groups of people who are happier to take early releases of, of software. Um, so that's something that we've got to work on. I mean, also there's the commercial reality that some of our products just have more users, have a bigger market than, than other products. Um, but I think... Um, we haven't really ascertained yet the, the threshold at which the the, uh, the, d the data is, is meaningful, but my sense is it's pretty low. Um, that it's certainly, I don't think you need thousands of users to gain some insight into what's happening. I, I think in, in the order of you know dozens or small number of hundreds, we could sensibly have some confidence in um, in the data. So um, yeah, there are there are products where we where we still haven't yet worked out to get enough data. Um, something that we that we need to try is you know uh, what mechanisms can we use to give people confidence with what will happen with their data to encourage more people to sign up. And there's also the practical um, issue that some customers are behind soft, behind firewalls and they just can't actually send us the data the data back. And we just I think we'll probably just have to live with live with that one. Um, yeah, Does that answer the question. Yeah, so it's a, it's a hard thing to measure, um, but we find that most of our users do, particularly during the EA. So we know how many people have downloaded the product, and we know how many people have opted in to both feature usage reporting and exception reports. So you can work out a ballpark figure of the percentage of your users that are sending, sending in this data, and for us it's quite high. And I think one of the reasons is that we do that different crash dialogue. So it puts a slightly more human face on it. If you leave the standard Windows one, people assume that goes into a black box because Microsoft never contact you, for example, if you know, their users are just their user base is too large to do that. But for us, we can collect more personal not personal data, we can collect the user can give us context as to what they were doing at the time and then they're I think they're more um, more likely to send in that data. Can we just add to that that I think um, part of 